there's so much work to do. Thank you, ladies, for that beautiful message through music. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to be. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4? All the young people are going to be part of the kids' corner. My wife and daughter, Lindsay, are there. You'll follow her out from four years old up to fifth grade, and uh, they'll enjoy their time. I I'm reminded that one time my, my, the kids were so excited, so excited that they were going to go and be a part of the kids' corner class. And, and uh, after the service, my wife usually comes by me and we shake hands. And this little four-year-old girl came up to my wife and I and she says, Mrs. D, who's that guy? Talking about me. And Mrs. D said, my wife said, well, that's my husband. What does he do? And as quick as she said that, Pastor, she said, oh, I bet you he's the driver. <laughs> you know, kids can make you really humbled, can't they? I mean, honestly. 
So I'm just the driver, that's all I am to some people, but uh, we have enjoyed ourselves so far, I hope that you have. What a, what a great service yesterday we had, what a great start to the revival meeting, but can I tell you this, God's not done. God's not done. He, he's got plenty for us to work on. And our theme this whole entire week is being restored. Being restored. And we said that we have to have all three principles. Realization that something's wrong. A pronunciation of what is right. And definitely a confession of what's been done. And so I hope that that will be true in every service. Not just yesterday's service, but it'll be true in tonight's service and in tomorrow night's service. Why? Because if we're ever going to be restored back to the mountaintop, we're going to stay in chapter 7 until we're restored back up to the mountaintop of chapter 8. And that's how you get there, all right? So I hope that that'll practically work in your life. Ephesians, though, is where we're going to be tonight. Now, if you haven't ever studied the book of Ephesians... I want you to write down this phrase because I believe this phrase can really summarize the book of Ephesians, okay? So I, I really think it can help you in your study of the book of Ephesians. Here's the phrase. Here's the phrase. Until you understand what God has done for you, you will hesitate at what God has for you. I'll say it again, so don't worry if you missed it. Until you understand what God has done for you, you will hesitate at what God has for you. You say, what are you talking about? Let's say that tonight I decided that I was going to come over to Pastor James and I was going to say, hey, Brother James, I, I want to give you I want to give you a thousand bucks. He's obviously going to accept it, okay? And, and say, you know what, Brother James, the Lord just laid this on my heart. I got 10 brand new 100, crisp $100 bills, Benji's, and I, and I want to give them to you. You know what just happened? I became his favorite preacher, all right? But truthfully, because Pastor James is a, is a, a well, I don't know if we should fill in the blank or just let you people figure it out, all right? But anyways, uh, because he's a good guy, he, he would probably say something like, oh, Brother Jake, don't worry about it. Don't, you don't have to do that. And I said, no, 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 no. The Lord told me that I'm supposed to give you a thousand bucks. He'd say, praise God. I'm so glad you listened to the Lord. But he'd probably come around and say, hey, Brother Jake, is, is there anything I could do for you? Hey, Brother Jake, can I wash your trailer? Now watch. I saw him all day yesterday, okay? I was here two years ago and met him, and not one time in all the occurrences that we've ever been together has he ever come to me and said, hey, Brother Jake, can I wash your trailer? Not one time. Maybe he'll get right with God and ask this week. <laughs> but truthfully, my question is, why... Is he now asking if he can wash my trailer? I'll tell you why. Because he's understood, he understands what I've done for him. I've just given him $1,000 cash. And because he has this new understanding, get it, he has no problem washing my trailer. We get to the book of Ephesians, you know what we find? It's broken up in two sections. The first three chapters talk about the riches we have in Christ. Matter of fact, chapter 1, verse number 7, tells us the riches we have in Christ. Chapter 2, verse 7, tells us the, the exceeding riches we have in Christ. Chapter 3, verse number 8, if you're a little hard-headed like me, tells us the unsearchable riches we have in Christ. You get the idea? Paul is trying to describe the riches we have in Christ. Now listen to the phrase, until you understand here, not here. Until you understand here what God has done for you, the riches you have as a child of God. You'll hesitate. You'll, that's my pastoral word. My evangelist word is this, you'll reject. You'll resist. I'm not doing that. No, no, no. Can I tell you why you're telling God no? Here's why. Because you don't understand here what God has done for you. And so in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, you really get all the riches we have in Christ. And by the way, if you've never studied that, you need to go home and make that your study from now to the end of the year. 
Because in the last four cha- three chapters, chapter 4, 5, and 6, you know what he gives us? The responsibilities we have in Christ. See what I'm saying? It's kind of like Pastor James. All of a sudden, he's all about washing my trailer. You know why? He understands here what I've done for him. And so when we get to chapter 4, if you don't understand chapter 1, 2, and 3, you know what you think of it as? Legalism. This whole thing of Christianity is a whole set of rules. It's a bunch of rules. That's all it is. It's not. Matter of fact, if you understand in the first three chapters what he's done for you, you're going to get to chapter 4 and say, that's it? That's all you have for it? Lord, that's all you want from me? God, I mean, honestly, God, that's all you want me to do? Why? Because you've understood how much he has done for you. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, notice with me chapter 4, would you? Look what it says in verse number 1 as we read down to verse number 3. Look what your Bible says. It says, I therefore, okay, all you Bible students, all right, Anytime we see the word wherefore or therefore, our little antlers should come up and say, hey, wait a minute, why is the wherefore or the therefore therefore, all right? Now you know. Paul's saying because of all the things that you have been blessed by, the riches you have in Jesus Christ, I therefore, look what he says, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, beg of you, uh, uh, that ye walk Worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. You know what Paul is saying? Hey, now that you understand what, how you have been blessed by God, now you understand the riches that God has done, given you, you know what? Would you walk worthy of the vocation that God has called you? Would you walk worthy? I'm not telling you that you have to be a preacher, but the vocation that God has called you. Hey, if you're an electrician, or you're a carpenter, or you're a nurse, or you're a doctor, or you're a lawyer, hey, whatever it is, hey, would you walk worthy of the vocation that God has called you? Keep reading. Look at verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, look at verse three, endeavoring to keep the unity. Tonight, I'm going to preach a message that I've entitled, How to Keep the Unity. How to Keep the Unity. But before we get started, can we ask God to give us a hand? Father, we thank you so much for this place, and Lord, the services we've already had. And no doubt, Father, you've worked mightily here this week already. But Father, there's some decisions that need to be made in order to restore the unity in this place. And Father, I pray that we would see truth tonight and Lord, we would properly respond to it. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for what you're going to do here in the invitation time. In Jesus, my precious Savior's name, amen. How many of you would agree with me that if we had unity, our marriages would be better? Raise your hand. Wouldn't you think? Sure, sure. How many of you think this? If we had unity, our homes would be better? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you believe if we had unity in the church house, the church house would be better? Raise your hand. Now watch. Everybody's raising their hand. Isn't that amazing? We already all know that, but how little there actually is. And what Paul says is, I want you to walk worthy of the vocation that God has called you. Some of you, your husbands. Some of you, your wives. Some of you are young people. Some of you are deacons. Some of you are deacons' wives. Some of you are leaders, your teachers in the school. Hey, would you walk worthy of the Lord? And if you're going to walk worthy of the Lord, look what he says is going to have to be in our life in verse 3. It says, endeavoring to keep the unity. It means this, you're going to have to work at it. That's what the word endeavoring means. You're just going to have to work at it. Now watch. Tonight, Paul gives us right here three areas that we're going to have to work on if we're ever going to restore this unity in our marriage, in our home, or in our church family. It doesn't matter. The principles remain the same no matter what part of the unity factor we're talking about. But by the way, by the way, you know what I read in my Bible? 
God works in a mighty way when people are in one accord. Read the book of Acts. And let me tell you, God wants to do amazing things in your life. But listen, you and I are going to have to say, you know what? I don't have this, but I need it. There's got to be that realization. Why? Because let me tell you, if you want to be restored out of the valley of defeat and get back to the mountaintop, this is going to have to be a part of it. And if you're here tonight and you say, well, I don't really need that. Hey, can I tell you? Can I tell you your problem? I'll tell you what your problem is. You only know what God's done for you here. You don't know what he's done for you here. Because until you understand what God has done for you here, you'll hesitate. Nah, I don't need that, preacher. That's not important, preacher. You'll resist. Nah, I'm not doing that, preacher. You'll reject. Nah, I don't think so. What God has for you. God has for us to be unified. Look with me. Notice the first area we've got to work on. Look at verse number two as we dive right into it. The Bible tells us in verse number two, it says, With all lowliness and meekness and with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. All right, the first area that he kind of helps us out here is number one. He says, if we're ever going to keep the unity, we've got to work on some character. Look what the Bible says. He gives us quite a few characteristics. Matter of fact, what's interesting about this is that these characteristics often tend to dealing with others. What are you saying, preacher? Look at the first one. He says in verse number two, with all loneliness. You know what this is? Humility. Matter of fact, if you just turn one page, at least in my Bible, to Philippians chapter 2, look what he says in verse number 3. He says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, here it is, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Now this is very interesting. You know what God says? You know what Paul says through the inspiration of God? He says this, hey, if we're ever going to have unity, we got to get rid of the two people that are all about themselves. How many of you have realized that two prideful people don't get along real well? Anyone figured that out yet? Sure don't. You know what the Bible says? This is amazing. He says, hey, if you're ever going to have unity, here's what we got to do. We got to get rid of that pride. We got to get rid of that boasting. We got to get rid of that self exaltation. Why? Because the Bible says, whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, but he that humbles himself shall be exalted. The Bible says, before destruction, the heart of the man is haughty, but before honor is humility. The Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Listen to me. God cannot stand pride. And for some reason, we think it's okay in our lives. I'm amazed about it. I'm amazed. Matter of fact, pastor, I'm amazed how much pride is in the pulpit. Can I tell you this? God's not showing up if he's not going to get the credit. Did you hear what I just said? God's not showing up to cross a cornerstone if if God doesn't get the credit. He's not. He's not. Why? Because God can't stand pride. Don't you remember the whole incident with Lucifer? You know why he got cast out? It wasn't because he was a devil, okay? It's because he wanted God's place. He wanted to take God's spot, and God says, no, you're not taking my spot. Matter of fact, you're getting cast out. Now watch, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination to him. Number one, a proud look. And it's amazing to me how many people that go to our churches live their lives full of this and they're okay with it. Can I tell you this? There's no good type of pride. I tried, I tried to look for it. I tried, I tried, I tried. Why? Because I wanted to justify my pride in my life. After studying the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, I came down to this. There's no pride that God accepts. None. Why? Because it exalts me and puts him down. And God's not interested in that. God is the one that needs to be high and lifted up. It's him that's done it all. It's not Jake DeAndre. He's just used me to do his glory. And can I tell you? If we're ever going to have this unity, we've got to work on some character. Now listen, listen, that's not easy. You know why? Because many of us have already developed the habit of living this way. 
And so guess what happens? We're trying to break it, but it doesn't come natural. But neither does unity. And what my Bible says, if you understand what God has done for you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to endeavor to keep the unity. You've got to work on some character. But notice what else he says. He says in verse number two, he says not only loneliness, he says and meekness. You know what this is? This is strength under control. This is not weakness. This is strength under control. You say, what are you talking about? How many of you fellas have ever experienced this? Sunday morning. Praise the Lord for Sunday mornings. Amen. You've been asked by the preacher or some leadership to come to church early. So you're in the vehicle. You're early. But your better half isn't as early as you. And you think, hey, I need to let her realize we're running behind. And as you see the clock ticking, and you know you're going to be late, you decide to lay on the horn. Ah, ah, ah. Now, now, you know what I found after doing that one time? That does not promote unity. No, sir. You know what doesn't promote unity also? When you have a diesel dually truck and you rev the motor with a six-inch exhaust pipe that just layers black smoke in the front door as she exits the building, it does not promote unity. She doesn't like to be smelled like diesel. She doesn't. All right? I know that. From personal experience, all right? That does not promote unity. But can I show you, can I tell you what I lacked? Here it is, meekness. Why? Oh, I wanted to be there. And all you husbands know what I'm talking about. You don't want to be late, okay? But the horn and diesel fuel do not promote unity. And you know what I needed to learn? I needed to learn this. Hey, meekness. I need to have strength and control. Why? Because it's easy to lash out, isn't it? Or am I the only one that's easy to lash out? You guys are looking like way too spiritual tonight. <laughs> They're like, oh, preacher, you're wicked. <laughs> but seriously, it's easy to lash out when, when you're pressured and, and time crunch and, and all the rest of the things. It's easy to let it fly, especially on Sunday. I don't know why it is Sunday. But, man, it's easy to let that happen. But you know what's amazing to me? The Bible says, according to this passage, if we're ever going to keep the unity, here's what we got to do. we got to work on some control. we got to work on some character, I should say. And he says, hey, number one character is loneliness. Number two, meekness. Look what else he says. With all uh, uh, Loneliness and meekness with long-suffering. That's obvious, isn't it? Look at the next one. With, here it is, with forbearing one another in love. You say, well, preacher, what's that? That's, that's cutting some slack. You say, what are you talking about? Well, I, I was telling pastor, before the Lord calls in evangelism, I, I'm a tile setter by trade. And so I have done flooring all of my life. If you look at my left thumb, I have a cut there. My, I cut my thumb with my carpet knife at the age of five. My dad was so proud, my mom hated it, okay? But uh, I've been doing flooring all of my life. So as a dad that only has one son, I thought, well, it's kind of, there's probably some child labor laws about five, okay? So we'll wait till eight, all right? Eight's a good age. And so I, I brought Bryce along with me starting at about eight, and uh, we would go do a job. And so here's Here's the typical routine, okay? Bryce, my, myself, Bryce, we'd go to the job. Every, all the parents, all the customers thought Bryce was so cute. You know how it goes, you know? And so then, then, uh, then he would, he, I would get him started. I said, oh, now, son, listen, listen. Here's your project, okay? Here it is. And so I would tell him his project. Now watch. I am, you think I'm kind of moving all around when I'm preaching, you should see me at work, okay? And so I'm wired a little bit different. And so what I do is I give him this one project, and then I would be like, getting all the rest of the job done, right? And, and so I'd come back an hour later, and Bryce, what's your problem? Why aren't you done? And here's what I do. I, I, I'd push him out of the way, and I would finish his project, and, and then we'd be wrapped up. 
We go to the next job. Same thing, man. We, he would drive me to the job. I said, all right, Bryce, now this is your job. You get this project done. And there I went. Woo! Zzz, you know, moving. Now, now, Bryce, okay, and I have different speeds. Let me demonstrate Bryce. Here it is. Ready? Ah. Uh, hey, Bryce, we're in a hurry. Ah. Uh, hey, Bryce, we could die. Ah. Uh, okay? We're just two different speeds. And so we would do this constantly. So it was about two years, and he was about 10 years old. One day he came to me and said, Dad, I quit. <laughs> you can't quit. Because I'm your dad, you can't quit. He's like, no, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm like, no, no, that's not even possible. You understand, this goes back to the old country. We're Italian. You, I only got three other girls. If you're not going to do this, that means it's dead. Like the line, the seed, the name, it's all over. You can't quit. I said, son, why in the world would you want to quit? Listen to what he said. He said, Dad, every time you give me a project, you give me this project, and, and, and then you go off and do your thing, and you come back, and you expect me to have this project done as if I've been doing it for 25 years. I'm 10. He said, Dad, you never let me finish a project. He says, I quit. You know what I had to do that day? I said, Bryce, I said, I'm sorry, bud. I should have never done that to you. I should have cut you some slack a long time ago. Bryce, would you forgive me? You know, today I was just telling Pastor, he just finished up doing about 1,200 square feet of laminate at a particular job. You know why? Because his daddy had to learn to work on some character. That's why. You know what Paul says? Hey, if you're ever going to keep the unity, can I tell you? You're going to have to work on some character. Yeah, that, that means you, okay? That means me. Why? Because there's differences. But you know what? God made us that way for a reason. But notice the second area we've got to work on. Would you pick up the reading with me in verse number 7? Look what your Bible says. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led the captivity captive. Notice this phrase. And he gave gifts unto men. Now drop down to verse number 11. And he gave these gifts, some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Notice why. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith. All right, number two, the second area that we got to work is not only work on some character, but number two, we got to work within the church. We got to work within the church. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? Now listen, listen. The Bible says that God's plan, not our plan, not Pastor Salazar's plan, not Pastor James's plan, not Pastor Josh's plan. It's not what we came up with. But God's plan is this. He said, you know what? I'm going to gift these certain individuals some apostles. Now, we know there's not apostles today. This is theology class, okay? Because, because you had to have seen the resurrected Christ, okay? So nobody here has seen the resurrected Christ. And if they had, they just had bad pizza with anchovies on it last night, okay? They're, they're, no one's has seen the resurrected Christ. Number two, he said he gave some prophets. Now listen, the reason why we don't have prophets today is because we have the completed canon of scripture. Everything that God wanted us to know is right here in this book. Nothing more needed, nothing less needed, right here. Everything that he gave us is exactly what we need, and we don't need any more prophets. Then the Bible says he gave some evangelists. Guess who that is? Me. All right? Some guys that are going to go around the country and, and in the world and they're going to preach truth just plain and simple so that people can see it the way God has it. And the Bible says he gave some pastor teachers. Well, for what? Why? Well, look at verse number, verse number 12. 
For the perfecting of the saints. It means the maturing of the saints. If the Bible says, or the completion of the saints, it says for the work of the ministry. Well, what's the ministry? It's the church. Look what it says. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Now watch. Did you realize that every one of us in this room have natural built-in blind spots? Got it? You say, what are you talking about? Well, when I hook up my truck and trailer, I'm about 55 feet long, okay? And uh, I've got these big mirrors on the side of my, my truck, and I've even got the little mirrors. But even though I got the big mirrors and the little mirrors, can I tell you this? There's about a 15-foot, what I call, a dead zone. You say, why is it a dead zone? Because if you're on a motorcycle and I'm cruising about 70, 75 miles an hour and you're in that 15 feet of my blind spot called my dead zone, let me tell you, you're done. Why? I'm 27,000 pounds at 75 miles an hour. You ain't got a chance, brother, okay? Now, I don't mean to kill you, all right? I don't want to kill you, but the truth of the matter is I can't see you. Now, watch. Watch. Every one of you parents in this room, you know what? You got natural built-in blind spots. You do. Every individual that is married, guess what? You have natural built-in blind spots in your marriage. You do. You do. Now watch. God knew that. That's the amazing part. And God says, listen, I have given you something. Here it is. The church. How many of you have ever heard someone say this? Well, I can worship God. I don't need church. I can do whatever I want. I'll be okay. How many of you have ever heard something to that effect? You know what the problem is? They don't know their Bible. That's all. They don't know their Bible. Why? Because God has given us this church to watch help in those blind spots. Now watch. Here's what's sad. A loving pastor, we got a couple of them in here, okay, will come to us and say, you know what, I, I saw, I see, I, uh, I've been observing your kid, and man, you know what, I, I'm just a little concerned. Maybe they're making some wrong decisions. Maybe, maybe they're heading down a pathway that I'm a little concerned about. And you know what usually comes out of our mouth if some loving pastor has this conversation with us? Well, have you ever looked at your kids? Now watch. They're not doing that for that. Because I guarantee you, most likely, they don't even want to come to you. They'd rather be quiet. They'd rather not even face this conflict. But watch. The Bible says that God has gifted certain individuals for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come in the unity of faith. Listen to me. You know what? God's brought people into our lives to help us. And what's so amazing is, so often people reject the help that God intended for them so they can help direct the path that needs to be taken, and people just blow them off as if those people that are trying to help hate them. Can I tell you, these people don't hate you. They actually love you a lot. Most of the time, if I'm with enough preachers in my lifetime, you know what? Most of them have wept hours before they've ever even come to you and thought about why. Because they want to make sure it's at the right time. They want to make sure it's the right attitude. And their hearts are broken. Why? Because you know when most people come to us? You want to know when? Most people come to the preacher when they've already gone to the, the, the lawyers and they've signed the papers and they come back and say, preacher, we just want to tell you, we signed the papers, we we're going to be divorced. Wait a minute, that didn't happen overnight. You didn't all of a sudden one day wake up and say, I hate you, I hate you, let's go down to the office and get a divorce. It doesn't happen that way. You know, when we get the phone call, when some, uh, some, one of our children is now going to the, uh, the jail or they're at uh, juvie and now our hearts are torn and broken and we're saying, wait a minute, what happened? As if, as if, as preachers, we had this spiritual crazy glue that we can put everything back together just perfect and it looks wonderful when we're done. We don't. You know what's so amazing? That Paul says, if we're ever going to walk worthy of the Lord, 
In whatever vocation God's called you, you got to endeavor. You got to work at keeping the unity in your marriage. You got to work at keeping the unity in your family. You got to work at keeping the unity right here in this church house. And you got to work within the church. Hey, can I tell you this? I love this passage because of verse number 15. Look what it says. The Bible says in verse 15, but speak, but speaking the truth in, what's the word? You probably forgot it's in this passage, don't you? Didn't you? You see where unity and love come together? Somebody's going to come to you sometime in your lifetime, and you know what? They're not doing it because they hate you. They're doing it because they love you. Because they don't want to see your kids make a decision. They don't want to see your family, your marriage, go down the slippery slope. And so many people, you know what they do? They just flare up and flare out. Can I tell you this? That's not how you keep the unity. According to Paul, Paul says, hey, you got to work on some character. You got to work within the church, but get number three and we'll be done. Look with me in verse 17. Look what your Bible says. It says, This, Paul speaking, I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. Hey, don't walk like the world. Come on. Look at verse 18. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. Hey, if that's how you're living right now, listen to me. You haven't learned Christ. Look at verse 21. If so be that ye have heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. All right, give me, let me give you number three. Number three is simply this. If we're ever going to keep the unity, we've got to work on some changes. We're going to work on some changes. Now, this is the principle in the Bible we call the remove and replace principle, right? Paul says, hey, you need to take off the, the former conversations. It's literally like the jacket, right? The coat. Hey, get rid of that thing. Man, that thing, that's the old conversation. That's the old lifestyle. That's the deeds of the old man. Don't you be wearing that. You got to work on changing that. Get rid of that out of your life. And then what's he say? He says, and put on the new man, which is created after righteousness and my opinion. Some of you are like, I didn't know that was in the Bible. It's not. Righteousness and, you know, I call it ideology. Well, preacher, this is what I think. No, it's not there either. It's righteousness and true holiness. Isn't that amazing? So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to work on these changes. I'm, I'm supposed to get rid of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful us, and I'm supposed to put on the new man, which is righteousness and true holiness. Well, in the rest of the chapter, he really gives us uh, examples or illustrations of that. Look with me just at a couple, and we'll be done tonight. Look with me in verse number 25. Look what the Bible says. Wherefore... Putting away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Can I tell you what the Bible says? It's real simple. How many of you here would agree with me on this? How many of you agree with me that our marriages would be better if we were honest with one another? Raise your hand. Huh? Oh, wow, isn't that amazing, all right? How many of you would agree with me? How many of you think we'd be better, our families would be better if we spoke honesty one to another? How many of you would agree with me? How many of you think this church house would be better if we were honest with one another? Raise your hand. Man, isn't that neat? Everybody agrees, but we don't do it. Got to work on some changes. I was telling the young people, one of the greatest battles that they're actually going to face in their life is this battle of the image. 
You say, what are you talking about? Now listen, one of the principles we talked about in chapel today is a reason why Joseph and Mary. Remember Joseph and Mary? The Bible says, but Joseph being a just man. The reason why he was just is because his relationship with God was more important than his, rela- or than his reputation. And I told the young people, listen, isn't it amazing that here's our reputation. Now listen, according to Proverbs 22, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. I'm with you, okay? Nothing wrong with having a good name. I'm not bashing that. Here's my problem with it. We're more concerned about our image than our relationship with the Lord. So here's what happens. We all know that lying's wrong, right? Anyone here not know lying's wrong? But isn't it amazing how that we will lie to others about ourselves? Watch this. Even though we know that God cannot stand it. You know what that proves? We're more concerned about our reputation than we are our relationship with the Lord. Look what he says. Wherefore, put away lying. And what's crazy is a husband and a wife relationship, a wife doesn't want to find out that her husband's been lying to her. And the opposite is true. And there's parents in this room. You don't want to know that your kids have been lying to you or you, your kids find out you've been lying to them. No, but that doesn't work well in the home. But how often it arrives in our home. And Paul says, you've got to work on some changes. You've got to work on some changes. Look what else he says. Look what he says in verse, look what he says in verse number 29. I love this. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Can I be transparent with you tonight? If someone were to ask me, Brother Jake, if you could turn back the hands of time, I know you can't, but if you could, what would you do different? Here's what I would do different. There's two things that Baptists are really good at, okay? Can I, can I inform you on in this? Number one, potlucks, okay? We can bring a potluck like no one's business. I mean, a bring-in lunch, we, can, we, we really know how to cook here in Baptist circles, okay? But let me tell you the other thing that we're really good at. Here it is, being critical. We are masterful at this. If I had to change one thing in my parenting, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I've been way too critical. You say, preacher, how do you know you've been critical? Here's, what, here's the test. Here's the test. Unbeknownst to your children, listen to them. Listen to them communicate about authority. If they criticize authority, can I tell you? They probably learned it from you. Now, pastor, I'm not justifying my faults because there's really, let me quote the verse for you. Let, what's the next word, class? No corrupt communication. You want to know what it means in Greek? No. See, you don't even have to take the class, all right? There's not, well, sometimes it's justifiable. No, 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 no. It says this, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Did you get me? Here's what happens. Our children learn how we communicate. If we're critical about authority, and there's times, I get it, as a leader, you have to make decisions. I got it. I got it. I totally understand that. But I'll tell you this, you don't have to make those decisions in front of your children. You want to know why? Because they will become very critical and they don't know the difference. So now every authority that comes in their life, here's what they do. They critique them. Wait a minute. It's not your job to critique them. But get it. They don't understand that because they've only heard you critique everything that everybody has done it besides the way you do it. It's not good. You say, why isn't it good? Let me quote the verse again. Let no corrupt communication 
proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may bring grace to the hearer. You say, well, preacher, I don't think it's that bad. Here's my question to you. Here's my question. Who here can honestly say being critical has helped the unity in your marriage? I don't see any hands, okay? Who here can honestly say, hey, being critical has helped my family life tremendously? Who here can honestly say, you know, being critical is such a key role in the unity of this church family? Watch. But it's all over us. You know what Paul says? You've got to endeavor to work on the unity. He said, well, preacher, I can't change what has been done. You're right, I can't either. But you know what I heard one preacher do? This is what he did. I love it. He put a jar in his house, and he brought home 50 $1 bills. Set them right on the counter. Every time someone was critical, every time someone heard someone was critical, here's what they did. They put their name on the dollar bill, put it in the jar. At the end of the month, whoever's name was not on, it's kind of like golf. You don't want the most points, you want the least points, okay? Whoever's name was the least amount on the dollar bills, guess what? They got all the money. Great idea. Love it. I haven't started yet because we're on the road, but when we get home in December, it's going to happen. Why? Because I want them to realize it's that important. Because I'll tell you this, Pastor, I've sat next to couples as they have shredded one another, and I thought, wow, I wonder where they learned to be so critical of one another. I've sat next to families, and the families were just shredding one another to bits and pieces. And I thought to myself, where in the world did they learn to do that to one another? And God just kind of did one of these. Maybe at your house. I said, that's it. That ain't happening no more. I don't care if i got to make a decision for the President of the United States. I'm not going to be critical in front of them. Because it is not worth it. And can I tell you this? Until you understand what God has done for you here, listen to me. You'll hesitate. Nah, that's a cool thing to have, unity. But you know, preacher, I, I'm fine without it. No. See, if you don't think it's important, I'll tell you what the problem is. What God has done for you is only right here. And it doesn't change your life till it gets right here. That's why Jesus, Jesus openly rebuked the Pharisees. He said, guys, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. How do we keep the unity? How do we restore that? It's real simple. Work on some character. There's nobody in here perfect, including this preacher. Work within the church. Number three, work on some changes. Would you bow with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed tonight. Church family, we've said all week, if we're ever going to be restored, there's got to be a realization that something's wrong. There's got to be pronunciation of what is right. And there's got to be, there's got to be confession of what has been done. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Jake, I want that unity in my home. I want it in my marriage. I want it in this place. But truthfully, Brother Jake, Would you pray for me that I would work at keeping the unity? Brother Jake, I want to be restored. I want that unity to be restored in my life. 
Hey, if that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one's looking, but God's speaking to your heart tonight. You know who you are. You'd be honest with yourself and honest with God. You say, Brother Jake, that is me all the way. Brother Jake, would you pray with me that way? Just quietly slip your hand up. Long enough for me to see it. Put it down. Wonderful, wonderful. Hands, hands, and more hands across the building tonight. Just a moment, I'm going to pray. When we're done praying, we're going to stand. The piano's going to begin. Hey, can I tell you this? This place down here is what I call a place for grace. See, God resists the proud, but he gives lots of grace to the humble. Hey, would you come and do business with God? There's people already here. Would you join them tonight? And would you start the journey of restoring that unity in your life? Father, thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit. And Father, how you've already worked in so many. Father, how I've had to work on it in my own life. And Father, I pray for these that are in this place, that Lord, they would respond to your Holy Spirit. And Lord, you show them the victory. Well, thank you for it. In Jesus, my precious Savior's name.